Hello all of you little demons, Jules here for WhatCulture.com, back again with another episode of the awesomely named and awfully hosted Choose Your Own Adventure, the weekly medieval theme format where I, the crown jewels of WhatCulture.com, take a list chosen by you, yes, you, the person who's actually recording this for the second time, got down to entry number one, but Audition decided that it was only going to capture one minute forty of my audio. Thanks, mate appreciate you. Yes, you get to decide what list I dole out to you each and every week. And this week we have none other to thank than <laughs> Settling Static for their suggestion of video games that were designed to troll you. Now it's never nice to be made fun of. Whether your new shirt hasn't gone down a storm at the office like you'd hoped, or you just slid down an embankment at school and now look like you've had explosive diarrhea, or simply forget to check your audio before recording this bloody video, being mocked by your peers isn't exactly what we all sign up for. But thankfully we have the escapism that is video games. Places where we can just basically go and not have to deal with any of that bullshit, right? Well, that's a hefty dose of wrong, my friend, because sometimes developers go out of their way to utterly troll you. And that's what we're here to talk about today. As I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com, and these are eight video game moments that were designed to troll you. And you know the drill by now. Say hi to me here in the live chat and put your suggestions for next week's episode down in the comment section below. And with that, let's get on with this list, shall we? Number 8. Warp Pipe Madness – Mario The Lost Levels Now while he might look like butter wouldn't melt in his overalls, the mustachioed Nintendo mascot known as Mario isn't actually the type to wear a white cap. Well, outside of magical, shape-shifting ones, but I digress. And I say this because he and his parent company have routinely mocked and cajoled their player base. I mean, just look at the whole Super Mario 2 being Doki Doki Panic Exchange, where a Mario skin was basically slapped on top of an entirely different title and then paraded around as an official entry for the West. This resulted in the fact that Nintendo deemed the actual Super Mario sequel as being too difficult for American gamers, and so did the old switcheroo to keep the big boohoo babies happy. However, happy they were not when the ruse was discovered, because they demanded that they got the official True and Blue Super Mario 2 treatment. And to their surprise, Nintendo obliged but many of us wish they hadn't because this game is an utter nightmare. And by that I mean that they released what should be known as Mario Maker's precursor onto the world, aka a living hell of trolling moments. I'm talking about you, poisonous mushroom you find in the first box in the first level. <laughs> You're an ass. But the biggest pinnacle of this was found in Stage 3-1. Here the player could leap over the flagpole at the end of the stage rather easily, and rather than question this, gamers dashed onwards to what would surely be a warp pipe quick skip to another later level. What they found, however, was the exact opposite, in that it was a pipe that sent them all the way back to Stage 1-1. <laughs> oh, Nintendo. <laughs> Please, stop, I'm already dead. Number 7. The Metal Gear Solid 2 Opening Oh, Hideo Kojima, you truly are the greatest troll to ever zip up a tuxedo onesie and place a pork pie hat in your head made out of actual pork pies, because you so thoroughly love trolling your fan base that you've turned it into an exquisite art form. Now, while I would love to wax lyrical on the nearly full-length movie cutscenes across all of his games and bask in the sickly glow of that Princess Beach moment, seeing as these are so beyond the pale when it comes to wasting your time and testing your patience, but the real, full troll move from Mr. Kojima and pals came in the reveal of Metal Gear Solid 2's protagonist. Thanks to the deliciously engaging Metal Gear Solid 1 experience, players were pretty much ready to stake their houses on Metal Gear Solid 2, once again plopping you in the very form-fitting shoes of Solid Snake, as after all, he was a huge hit with audiences, and who wouldn't want another trip around that very gruff-voiced son? Plus, thanks to a rather extensive demo dropped before the game launched, Launched, which posited players as Snake, it all seemed like a done deal. Except the only deal done was a deal done with the devil. Do da ding do ding ding done. What was he even saying here? Oh yeah, you played as another person entirely. <laughs> Enter Raiden, the new pretty boy protagonist for Metal Gear Solid 2 who is basically Kojima stating to the audience, You will like what I tell you to like. This move set the internet ablaze with fans complaining about the literal bait and switch and stands as Kojima's largest monument to the god of trolling. Which makes me think, what would a god of trolling actually look like? Some sort of Daedric prince, but it's just like this ugly troll just going, eh, eh, how'd you like that? How'd you like that, mate? 
Number six, Whimsy Shire, Diablo 3. Now, whereas some of the trolling moments on this list are singular examples of developers having fun at the player's expense or roasting the very genres within which they lay, when it came to the secret Whimsy Shire level for Diablo 3, things got taken to another plane of existence, as this, well, this was an entire set of enemies and a complete environment made to directly troll players. Now, this crazy tale of manic unicorns and fluffy, angry clouds all started when a gameplay demo for Diablo 3 started doing the round and was met with considerable backlash from fans who cited the game as being too colourful and excessively cheery, mainly due to a rainbow effect that was used in the demo to showcase the mist in one area. Now, This led to an internal debate within the dev team, and as explained by lead designer Wyatt Cheng, the team took this rather vitriolic and, let's just call it, passionate feedback and decided then and there to stick it to the haters in a very creative way. Thus, Whimsy Shire was born, an area that looks like it was ripped directly out of the Care Bears animated TV show, but then sprinkled with a liberal dose of violence and then served up for your gaming pleasure. Mm -hmm. Ooh, <laughs> that's tasty gameplay cooking with jewels, and acted as both a reward for devout players to find and a middle finger for those critiquing a game for expanding its graphical horizons. And as Cheng put it himself, just before the fields of misery where you're crossing a bridge, we have a rainbow created from the mist of the river because, you know, that's what light does. So yeah, if you were arguing the point about this rainbow not having a place in Diablo 3, just remember, you're arguing against science. Good one, mate. Now who's the fool? Number five, collecting flags, Assassin's Creed. Now in the modern era of gaming, collectibles are everywhere. And you can kind of see why from a development perspective, because A, it allows you to encourage players to explore every single nook and cranny of your map and reward them for doing so. And B, well, because let's be honest, it's a way to pad out your games because there's stuff now, and we love stuff. Yet, as we all know, thanks to examples like the accursed Korok Seed Challenge from Breath of the Wild, sometimes a collector-thon can go very collector-wrong as they present a ridiculous number of pointless items for the player to gather, actively diminishing their will to see it through to the end. And there's nothing worse than looking at your tally of over 200 smashed doll eyes or peanut-covered pine cones or whatever stupid trinket you're collecting and thinking to yourself, wow, I am not even, like, halfway there. Sick eggs. Actually, no, wait, there is something worse than having to collect a ridiculous amount of stuff, and that's having to collect a ridiculous amount of stuff for a joke, because that is exactly what the flags from Assassin's Creed are all about, that were put there by the developers to basically act as a meta commentary that gamers will collect anything if they're told to. Ooh! Which is a fancy way of saying you just got trolled, mate. Over 400 flags with no reward and only a patched in achievement for PC players. I tell you, is one of these a white flag? Because I am bloody surrendering. Number four, investigate the voice until dawn. So this is what I like to think that Supermassive Games did when they started creating Until Dawn. They just opened up this big book of trolling, put it on the table, supped their coffee, which I'll do now and ASMR coffee for you for the people who really like that. Mmm, that is lukewarm. And they basically just cracked their knuckles. I, I did one. And they just went, ah. Time to get to work. Because this game is designed to mess with your expectations in a way that will leave you feeling utterly silly that you just didn't see it coming. Across your time with this title, you'll be presented with choices that seem simple at first, but that usually lead to events that are either the inverse of what you expected to happen or that lead you towards an even more dangerous outcome, like precious breadcrumbs towards a gaping hole of horror. Yet the devs knew that gamers and horror fans pride themselves on spotting a trope a mile away, and so used this I'm not falling for that mentality against them, which is best exemplified in the investigate the voice choice. Here, Ashley finds herself as the last person to enter cliched spooky scenario number four, and suddenly hears what she assumes is her friend Jessica calling out for help. Now, savvy horror fans might immediately see this and say to themselves, well, it's such obvious bait that it can't possibly be bait and push onwards, because surely the game is going to reward us for thinking against the grain, right? Wrong, because the only thing you get from this is is it is death. It's just death. It's just a big lot of death. Sick. Because a Wendigo will bust out and chew you like a dog toy should you keep pushing forward. And this is something that has made all the worse when you realise that you likely read a note about Wendigos being able to mimic human voices. <laughs> now who looks silly? Oh, it's me, because like I said before, I'm dead. R.I.P. me.
Number three, The Pendant, Dark Souls. Now, I'm pretty sure if you look at any From Software game cover long enough, you'll start to see tiny, tiny little words that if you squint, you can just make out, and they read, look behind you. And suddenly, you look behind you, thinking that there's going to be something there. And when you turn back and realise there's nothing, you look a bit closer again and see, lol, got you. Such is the trollish nature of From Software. Because Miyazaki and his team have routinely had our trousers down over the years, thanks to doors that lead to instant deaths, floors that fall out from under you for like no reason whatsoever, and a ton of bosses that just take a dump all over your expectations. And of course, there's the pendant, an item with literally no purpose other than to troll players. In the character creation screen of Dark Souls 1, the player is offered an array of starting gifts, many of which are extremely useful for certain builds and speedruns. However, of all of them, the pendant sticks out for its sheer strangeness. Now, the pendant's item description lists it as having no effect, but because we are conditioned to think that this is clearly a ruse and because Miyazaki himself said in an interview that it's the gift that he would personally choose, many players selected it anyway, assuring themselves that such a decision would pay off somehow at some point. Yet the only thing that you unlocked for choosing this was the not-so-subtle laughter of the devs at your expense, because the pendant has its stated many times over, literally does nothing. You are a fool for taking it. Now true, you can trade this item with another character, but at the same time, that's basically handing over a token saying, I am a complete and utter mug. Have fun with that. Number two, what's in the box? Edge of Eternity. In the, let's just be honest, it's just okay RPG title Edge of Eternity, you'll come across all manner of quests, NPCs in need of help, and beastly beasts to slay, which is pretty standard stuff. Except, within all of this tired and familiar expressions of warring nations, magic mcgubbins, and big evils from the school of scenery chewing, stands one moment that is so refreshingly brilliant that you'll almost forgive the game for trolling you into the Earth's bloody core. Whilst out adventuring and smashing creatures in the face with oversized weapons, you'll come across an NPC standing in front of a treasure chest. And as per your unofficial right to open every source of treasure you find, you ask if he can just kindly move out of the way so you can make your best Link opening a chest noise. Yet instead of da da na 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 the NPC will say da na 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 unless you pay me some money. Because he refuses to step aside unless you pay him some cold hard cash. Now basically we know this as being game speak for, there is actually something amazing in this chest, but you'll have to pay through the nose for it. And so we loosen the purse strings and pay a higher and higher price to access the chest. All to the tune of the NPC bizarrely warning us again and again that there is nothing of worth in there. Hell, he even goes so far at one point to say, look mate, I'll tell you what's in there. It's a regular potion. Are you sure? Are you 100% sure you want to go ahead with this purchase? I will take your money, but you are a clear mug for doing so. You do want to, okay, I warned you, I warned you, and wouldn't you know it, when you finally open it, da na na no 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 it is a potion. Shock, horror, surprise, who could have guessed? Now, technically, you do pop an achievement for this act, but it's really one that serves as a title reeling I got absolutely goofed on. And number one, that is not your game. FIFA Legacy Titles. Now, whereas most examples on this list were of devs merely having a laugh at your expense, EA really took the cake and the piss when it came to their legacy run of FIFA titles for the Nintendo Switch, as here it was at your expense in a very literal way for you were paying for a game that was absolutely the ancient. Rather than keeping pace with the rest of the franchise, EA decided that the Switch just couldn't handle all of those raw microtransactions and decided to take an existing game model and simply update the kits and teams before kicking out legacy titles at full price. Now, to say that this was a bit of a slap in the face for fans is a bit of an understatement, because they're basically being told, look, you see all these new like features that we're adding in? You don't get any of them. You see all of these new improvements to the gameplay? You don't get any of them. What you do get is just updated kits and a few new faces, some of which are wrong and are instantly outdated. Fantastic! Each year, less and less is changed, and more and more features are cut out entirely, meaning that Switch players are sitting here in 2022 playing a game from 2018 with faces redder than a baboon's ass. But making matters worse than all of this is that EA isn't even simply trying to hide it at this point. It has trolled gamers so hard that they're just part of the cycle now. They just go, we're not changing it. This is what it is, and you will still pay for it, because it's the only option available to you on the Switch. And Switch players are just like, I'm getting actively trolled, I'm aware of it, and I'm going ahead with it. What bizarro world are we living in right now? 
They purchase a game that they know won't be up to par, are made to feel bad about their purchase from the wider gaming community, and then sit on their thumbs waiting for next year's release in the hopes that something or anything might change. It is Stockholm Syndrome at this point, and it's pretty bloody grim. And there we go, my friends. Those were eight video game moments designed to troll you. I hope that you enjoyed that, and please let me know what you thought about it down in the comments section below, as well as your suggestions for next week's episode. Big love to all of you for submitting your stuff so far. I love reading your comments and the positivity that is in our chat. Big love to the community. And if you want to chat to us on the social medias in between these points, you can do so by following me over on Twitter at RetroJ, but the O is a zero, and you can follow James Dows or Dan Durkin. Not entirely sure who's edited this one here, hence why we didn't do any skit call-outs today because there's a, always a reshuffle of what the hell's going on with our time at the moment. But one of them is here. Show them some love. But before I go, I just want to say one thing. I am going to end this video with a moment that is not designed to troll you. And you should never troll yourself. You should be kind to yourself. You should treat yourself with the love and respect that you definitely deserve. Hell, you deserve all the best things in life, like love, happiness, and success. I know I bang on about it, but it's definitely true. So please go out there with love in your heart for yourself and your neighbor and try your best to make this world a better place because trust me the only way we're going to get through this is together all right so build those bridges instead of burning them and remember above all else you are a massive ledge big love to you as always i've been jules you have been awesome never forget that and i'll speak to you soon bye